Good afternoon, good morning, good night to all of you who are wherever you are. My name is Jacqueline A. Bruno and I'm the editor at C Magazine and have also been the director of and close collaborator of the Curious Criticism Symposium. Just to let you know, we are all recording this session. Thank you for joining us this evening for My Meteorite, an, in, an artist intergenre writing methodology by Harry Dodge. With a focus on form, curious criticism plays on curious as a method, as well as a descriptor for certain creative critical leanings. The series seeks to facilitate deep, meaningful engagement with the objects, texts, and experiences that we encounter in art, considering all the while what it means to do so in the midst of a global crisis. This symposium brings together writers, critics, artists, curators, and others to take up these questions in relation to their manifold practices. You can see the full list of events on our site, which Alex, our AV technician, has just posted in the chat. So the talk will run for about an hour, followed by 15 minutes for Q&A, facilitated by Loren Fournier, who's been the lead curator on the event, uh, working alongside Maya Wilson Sanchez and I. We encourage you to add questions to the chat at any point or use the raise your hand button. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that C's offices and where, I'm, where I am right now are also located in Toronto or to Toronto, a Mohawk word meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, which is said to refer to the wooden stakes that were used as fishing weirs in the narrows of the local river systems by the Haudenosaunee and huron wendat peoples. These lands are also the traditional and ancestral territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Anishinaabeg. Bearing in mind the complexities of acknowledging the land in the midst of an ongoing colonial project, we continue to do so at sea as an expression of gratitude for our hosts and in the effort to encourage our audiences to embody this acknowledgement in their daily lives in all the ways that are possible for them. Tonight, Harry will discuss his writing practice through the approach he took with my meteorite, or without the random, there can be no thing, no new thing, sorry, released by Penguin in 2020. The form of the book weaves artistic subjectivity with theory, life, literature, history, apocalyptic ideation, and eclectic deep dives. He'll also be exploring the relation between his writing and visual arts practices within the larger context of the art world. So it's a pleasure to have Harry with us this evening. Harry's a writer and visual artist. His recent book, Literary Nonfiction, My Meteorite, was a New York Times book review editor's choice and one of LitHub's most anticipated books of 2020. The, books, the book has been described as brilliant, exhilarating, transcendent, breathtaking, and a high pressure poetic approach to narrative and language. Having come, out of the, having come out the week before most lockdowns started in North America in early March 2020, my meteorite revolves around the question um, of whether socializing can generate a circumstantial personal electromagnetism powerful enough to plug me into the cosmos, end quote. To say it another way, whether hanging out with people makes synchronicity, coinc coincidences, a kind of patternicity more likely or more visible. This from someone with an evidently lush interior life, at one point saying, I'll never know because I just can't bring myself to socialize at any length or with a normal sort of density, end quote. Someone who thinks about the work they make as their social body, someone who seems to vibrate at a kind of immortal frequency. Dodge's sculpture, drawing, and video work have been exhibited at venues nationally and internationally. His solo and collaborative work is held in numerous institutions, such as the Museum of Modern Art New York, Hammer Museum LA, MOCA LA, and his writing has appeared in publications including Art Forum, the Paris Review, and Harper's. In 2017, Dodge was awarded a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. In the early 90s, Dodge was one of the founders of the now legendary San Francisco community-based performance space, The Bearded Lady which served as a touchstone for pioneering queer DIY literary and art scenes. During that time, Dodge also wrote, directed, and performed several critically acclaimed evening-length, monologue-based multimedia performances, including Muddy Little River in 1996, and From Where I'm Sitting, I Can Only Reach Your Ass, 1997. In the latter part of the 90s, Dodge co-wrote, directed, edited, and starred in with Silas Howard a narrative feature film by hook or by crook, which premiered at Sundance in 2002 and went on to garner several awards, including the audience favorite award at South by Southwest. That film, which is a kind of tragic buddy comedy between two trans guys is seriously essential viewing, if you ask me. Dodge, who was married to uh, the writer Maggie Nelson, 
has lived and worked in LA since 2001. He holds an MFA from Bard College and teaches at Cal Arts, where he's currently serving as program director. There's a heavy handful of, this thing, of things from this book that I've been carrying with me, including searing lucid ruminations on the ethics of memoir writing, the phenomenology of caring for someone in hospice, the proposition that we all have the knowledge of the universe inside us and that all we need to do is figure out how to glean it from our own flesh. And then there's something in the question, is knowledge fundamentally sensual, that Harry asks. In short, this book reminded me how soothing witnessing someone else's wonder can be. It's a very fun medicine. And I quote, I can't believe how many leaves there are in the world. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Harry. Thanks everyone again for coming. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Thank you, Jack, for that. That was really nice to hear all of that. And um, uh, I want to thank everyone, you know, for coming out. I really appreciate it. And to uh, Lauren and Jack and C Magazine for inviting me to speak at this great series. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to, I have about an hour, so I'm just going to pop in um to uh, uh th this thing i wrote for you all right so hang with me and um here we go so first just to set things up the book is called my meteorite or without the random there can be no new thing and for those who are wondering i'll give you a little copy from the cover it's basically an investigation into bonding and how we're shaped by forces we can't fully know. Uh, a reckoning with the vital forces of matter, the nature of consciousness, and the bafflements of belonging. The book is loosely structured around a series of coincidences in my life, most of which have to do with my birth family, who I discovered in 2003. Um, I braid a few other narrative strands, including my dad's decline and death from dementia with bits of my thinking and research on machine intelligence, sort of all during the time when I'm making work for a show, conducting studio visits. I've self-described as a matter enthusiast, and the book describes a couple of years of my study therein. Fresh questions about matter as they arose in me. What is the nature of its agency, its habits? What happens if I pressure these relatively minor proposals, extrapolate? For example, if reality is only material, no spirit, no special animating soul sauce, and if it is a fabric, all interconnected, how do those things work then on a human scale? in terms of daily living. But most important to mention for this particular talk is that the book is in large part a performance of thinking, a narrative of thinking, which is to say the bad thought, as I like to call them, the bad thought explained, and then, and in context, how I, the character of the author, go about making new, more, more relevant questions, the way the subsequent thoughts both emerge from and enmesh with my days. Okay, I'll start by telling you that there are, relatively speaking, very few things in this world that can be accurately measured, at least very few things of interest to me. And correspondingly, there's very little of interest to me in quantification. Or I should say there's very little that's not wildly frustrating about it, which should not be let to disaffirm my avid interest in specificity. But before I say more on this or talk about my practice, I think it'll be helpful to lay down a little initiatory framework. And apropos of that, I'll touch on four quick references or ideas, I guess. Well, three are quick and one's like medium. First thing I wanna tell you about is this wonderful dreamy essay film called 15 Experiments on Peripheral Vision, a short work by filmmaker Adele Horn, former colleague of mine at Callouts. Early on in the piece, she invites viewers to hold the thumb up at arm's length from their faces. We're told, we're, we're told to observe that what's actually in focus when we encounter the world is just that big, this central thumb-sized dot. She wonders where then does peripheral vision actually begin and end? Later on in the film, she reports the little known fact that some very faint stars can only be seen by our peripheral vision. To see them, we must look away. Related to this is the idea of peripheral thought Generally speaking, it's difficult to comprehend the transitive aspects of a situation as the substance of it or substance of any sort. We tend to think in stases. William James in a chapter called Stream of Thought suggests that consciousness alights 
which is to say that certain thoughts arrive to us consciously, a kind of stasis. But he suggests that valuable thinking, transitive thinking, the bulk of thinking is unconscious, a never ending stream, and goes on betwixt all of the more fixed thoughts we're conscious of. And now some bones under that. In a book called A Sketch of the Past, Virginia Woolf writes about something she supposes might be called a philosophy. She says, quote, at any rate, it is a constant idea of mine that behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern that we, I mean, all human beings are connected with this, that the whole world is a work of art, that we are parts of the work of art, unquote. With this, as I understand it, she's describing a hunch or a sense, a knowing that is also a wager. And right at this moment, I'm less interested in her characterization of it as a cosmically scaled work of art, which drops open questions about authorship, et cetera, at least to me. What I am interested in is the cotton wool, a palpable, and the behindness, which is a condition or orientation that can also be thought of as depth or parallelness, occultedness, or even one sense of the word abstraction. And then there's this patternicity, this hidden pattern. And there's also her profound sense of interconnection. This last longer anecdote, which maybe joins all of the above into a slanted circuit, is an excerpt from a 2013 pamphlet of mine, this kind of extended lyric essay in pamphlet form called River of the Mother of God V2. And this section in the pamphlet relies heavily on James Blight's book entitled Chaos, Making a New Science. Until the late 1970s, scientists, physicists had primarily when conducting a series of experiments looked for order, which meant conventionally repeatability. Of course, since most of the natural world is a kind of consumptive open system hocking up gobs of nonlinear turbulence, this limited purview for science was kind of a core dysfunction. Stanislaw Ulam once said, quote, using a term like nonlinear science is like referring to the bulk of zoology as the study of non-elephant animals, unquote. A belief in determinism had carried the day for centuries, but simultaneously, almost paradoxically, so had the truism that measurements can never be perfect. This disjunct or dogleg had been vibrating at the core of science for so long that it had become a sort of dead spot or maybe like a mouse trap you learn to step over without thinking. At any rate, the prevailing thought went like this. If you had approximate knowledge of a system's initial conditions and an understanding of natural law, you could calculate the approximate behavior of the system. As one theoretician liked to tell his students, the basic idea of Western science is that you don't have to take into account the falling of a leaf on some planets in another galaxy when you're trying to account for the motion of a billiard ball on a pool table on Earth. Very small influences can be neglected. Throughout the 1950s, this guy Edward Lorenz, a mathematically oriented meteorologist, that's someone who studies weather, he developed a protocomputer, a machine he called the Royal McBee which was able to continually process about a dozen variables that had been designed to represent weather-like forces, relations between air temperature and pressure, variations in pressure related to wind speed, et cetera. Forecasting then as now was basically impossible beyond a couple of days, but the Royal McBee was producing strange, messy bits of order, cycles that were recognizable as such, and so they were interesting to Lorenz, but they never happened the same way twice. Regardless, he sensed but wasn't sure that he was noticing an orderly disorder. One day in 1961, as James Gleick tells it, Lorenz wanted to investigate, quote, a sequence at greater length and took a shortcut. Instead of starting the whole run over, he started midway through. To give the machine its initial conditions, he took the number straight from the earlier printout. Then he walked down the hall to get away from the noise and drink a cup of coffee. When he returned an hour later, he saw something unexpected, something that planted a seed for a new science. This new run should have exactly duplicated the old. Lorenz had copied the number into the machine himself. The program had not changed. Yet, as he stared at the new printout, Lorenz saw his weather diverging so rapidly from the pattern of the last run that within just a few months, all resemblance had disappeared. He might well have chosen two random weathers out of a hat. His first thought was that another vacuum tube had gone bad. Suddenly, he realized the truth. There had been no malfunction. The problem lay in the numbers he had typed. In the computer's memory, six decimal places were stored, 0.506127. On the printout, to save space, just three appeared, 0.506. Lorenz had entered the shorter, rounded-off numbers, assuming that the difference, one part in a thousand, was inconsequential, unquote. In a deterministic universe, approximately the same, the same starting conditions would yield approximately the same results. But, like explains, this was different. 
In Lorenz's particular system of equations, these tiny deviations had proved cataclysmic. The results in this case had been profoundly sensitive to what is referred to as initial conditions. Lorenz apprehended something here, something that simply didn't fit with the scientific status quo. So at that point, he began working on ways to understand flow in all kinds of fluids. And the wildest thing here is that he didn't drop a wet blanket out of the scientific community. Hey, sorry, the world's just a muck of randomness and unpredictability. Instead, he actually saw a kind of order in aperiodicity, a fine geometrical structure, order masquerading as randomness. Sure, obviously a chain of events can have a particular odd point of crisis that might magnify small, small changes, but as Gleick writes, quote, chaos meant that such points were everywhere. They were pervasive. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions was an inescapable consequence of the way small scales intertwined with large, unquote. Now, as you may know, eventually scientists have been able to see structure flow relationships, the rhyming of fractal and chaotic harmonies, and everything from stock market fluctuations over decades to leaf edges, the shape of tides, snowflakes, wood grain, bird feathers, and a pot of boiling water. What had seemed random or turbulent was not exactly that. It was aperiodic, there was a kind of order, and it was also hard to detect, especially if you were set on rounding crap off, sloughing a couple of decimal points everywhere you go. Since I read it, the story has served for me as a reminder that heeding and seeking nuance, specificity, faceting, a kind of non-polemical complexity can keep me closer to structures that are not readily visible. Other or additional matrices, forces, possibly patterns, or even cosmic mores, which was what I said about coincidences recently. I think of my practice as that work, working at that. Not always toward pattern per se, which would suggest some final truth. I'm averse to that, but toward an otherwise hidden turbulence that matters. And when I use the word practice, I suppose I mean practicing like tennis practice, as in like what an athlete does. Whatever it is I'm up to, going at it every day. And you know, at this point, I've been going at it every day for a long time. But there's something else I want to say, and that is about habit. Habit is a weird word used in different fields with different meanings. Rocks have habits, for example. And in this context, the words used to describe how a rock breaks, how it likes to break. Félix Rabesson, in his book Of Habit, written in 1838, revalues the word the thing in humans by suggesting that habit is not a kind of grim, machinic, degraded condition or lapse in cognition and therefore possessed of a depressed socio-ethical gravitas, but rather a valuable category of thinking that the body assumes often as the fruit of repetition. I bring this up as a kind of resonant frame for a discussion of methodology. I assume artists and writers are alike in this, working from bewilderment, being gripped by questions. But as I understand it, one has to learn to find one's questions. And then one must find them every morning, like your glasses or some medicine. And then one learns to spend every day hammering away at them or whatever the verb, sketching and then parsing. Oh, that's not the thought, this is the thought. And that can happen in language, movement, or in the manipulation of materials. You build, follow sense like a bloodhound, you buzz, you contemplate. Contemplation is all libido in my experience of it. What I'm trying to say is by practicing, you eventually learn to let your questions crack you open while you're cracking them open. And once you're there, once you can do that, I think with few exceptions, an artist doesn't forget how to practice. It's sweaty, erotic, mind-bending labor practicing is, but we learn how to do it each in our way. And after decades, that knowledge is deep, body-mind deep, process is a griefy joy, a kind of fever. In practice, when practices, I practice. I find pleasure in allowing novel forms to emerge entwined with novel content. I'm not going to make the same piece twice or practice with the same questions in the same way twice, since things are always tangibly or intangibly changing, since we're always and already permeated by one another in the environment, which includes all forces, beings, things, a co-constituting that is never finished and never stops. Such a thing would be technically impossible going the same way twice. But some of these habits of address, the fever there might remain relatively constant, that sensitivity, uh, propensity to dissonance, to non-categorical thinking, to non-teleological thinking. A practice of allowing oneself to be riven with an intense pull towards specificity, disambiguation, which is a kind of work, can lead to places charged and furious with indeterminacy. 
non-mastery uncertainty even enter the picture. There's something voluptuous there. I mean, and this is likely true for most artists, I mean, almost by definition, we're experimentalists. Form, content, all that, nothing's rote. Hopefully, I'm finding my way around questions and thoughts that are arriving fresh and confusing every single day. With my meteorite, I wanted to make a book that I myself would like to read, and I really don't like anything too straightforward. I was not thinking about genre, and though I love breaking rules, I really do. I was not really thinking about breaking rules. Over decades, I guess, especially with regard to art and writing, I've sort of trained myself away from fighting with categories. Mostly now, I just sort of forget to remember them. Anyway, for what it's worth, I'm just trying to stay exactly on top of my best, weirdest thought. As I see it, my meteorite is like a large scale sculpture. It takes 18 hours to see it all, but if you don't look at everything, it's not gonna add up. Like a long poem, it accrues and by that action becomes itself. That said, and maybe it's not as obvious as I thought, there are two linear threads in the book, the years 2016 and 2017, and both move forward. The momentum is familiar in a way, by which I mean time moves in one direction there, and it's something for readers to track and care about, keep turning pages. When Lauren contacted me, <clears throat> she asked me to make a talk on my writing methodology. And so that's what I've done, that's what I'm reading. And since here we are doing this, I will tell you that my mind works like a wave machine. Just when I'm trying to disambiguate a certain thought or a proposal, waves of related items surge and overtake the thing I was going to say, that edible piece, that fragment, that social thing I was going to share. But not only that, it seems key suddenly that I deliver that thing that was going to be a fragment with all of the other items that somewhere in me I know are connected or causal or more importantly, part of the thought, specificities that will facet it, so to speak, make it not general, approximate and unknown, true and untrue in some way. And this profusion of other stuff, or so I always believe, will need to be also apprehended. Penumbral, umbral, affective, hard to take in, a kind of hot, pointy, ultra-specific indeterminacy that will save me, save our communication, make us known to one another. This rigor, as I conceive of it, I tell myself it will enable connection. Or maybe I should say a more authentic connection. Ah, this is all to say that in my writing, that is my practice, or in an assessment of my writing methodology, there's very little that is off the table as legitimately constituent. Which brings me, however obliquely, to the issue of biography. And I do have something to say on that account. First, I'll tell you that with few exceptions, I like to read things that are quote unquote above my pay grade. That is, I, I like to struggle some with the text. I enjoy work, which I suppose might be considered to be difficult, lyric, and leaping. This has always been true for me, or at least since this really clear moment when I was maybe 15. I was reading some poetry, it may have been Emily Dickinson, although Rumi and Virginia Woolf all came to me similarly around this time. I didn't have the words for it then, the why of it, but I have a very clear visual memory of the room I was in, a classroom with shiny beige tile flooring, and the girl I was in love with a few feet away at another desk, reading a love note from her then boyfriend, who was also a friend of mine. I had introduced them, how stupid. When the question arose in me, something I'm still trying to answer, why do I love this so much, these poems? Way more than stories. And I have a clear memory in my body of looking down at the page. I'm going to figure out why the energy in this was a thousand times more explosive and intriguing than what had come before this plotting narrative prose as I was then suddenly thinking of it. And I remember a sense that it had to do with space that is with not labeling, not trying to come down right on the head of something. It had to do with a kind of singularity or specificity, and it had to do with all of that kick, the unspoken tingly effulgence that the text generated, suggested, or made happen. I do believe it was then that my interest in affect, indeterminacy, the space between things, as I used to call it, which is admittedly a misidentification in this example. Anyway, I do believe this is where it began. But there was something else too, now that I think of it, another point of inception. One day, I'm hazarding here, it was the beginning of high school. We'd been assigned a research paper told to find news clippings. The librarian directed me to this massive compendium of black binders that as soon as she had pointed them out were unmissable. There were probably 200 of them in a row 
all on the top shelves of these stacks against the wall, this sort of unending black row binder spanning many shelving units, you know, making a structure unto themselves, this line. I walked along the row and scanned them and realized each had a label, a theme or purported subject matter. For example, oceans or plant life or music or computers or medicine. When I got toward the end of the line, I noticed a binder that said women. And then I noticed another one said the same. And another one, three binders for women, a coup, awesome. And then I walked back and looked for how many of them said men, and there were none. And then I remember thinking, those women binders are a problem. I was a kid, so I thought, until we get rid of those binders, we will not be considered to be equal. I thought of stealing them, burning them, putting them in a fucking garbage can. And I remember this titillating conundrum coming up fast and filling me a paradox, I thought, but if we got rid of them now, it would be too soon. It seemed the binders were a necessary part of a process. Too soon, too soon, I remember thinking, you can't get rid of them too soon. I suppose my thought then was twofold. There's no clear line as to what qualifies creatures as men and women, those categories, their, defini their definitions are illusory and fundamentally serve to make a patriarchy possible. I didn't think that in those words, obviously. But also, there may have to be a painful interim period of strategic alliance afforded by the use of these categories, categories that had been generated by the oppressor, some period of use long enough to cohere an effective overthrow of the system. I still think about these binders, the hard plastic coated cardboard containers, the long row of them, I remember thinking how many there were. It was impressive, even overwhelming, and also so few when you think about it. A whole world out there, and someone made this stupid row of binders. The tension that arose in me that day, you know, the vibration of disharmony or paradox, these things near each other, the amplitude of the bothness was riveting. Here, two things were true, but they crashed into each other. The ecstasy caused by this feeling of dissonance was unforgettable and an urge to it remains alive in me. And I guess also I still wonder, what do we gain and what do we miss by this ordering we do, by category, this basically constant use of resemblance and similitude in daily life as a primary ordering force? And I know it is arguably physiological and that it's a huge slice of intelligence, or at least the inchoate combustible momentum that generates intelligence, but still. And I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting, well, there's no difference between, you know, this and that and that and that. I'm not suggesting homogeneity or even hazy approximation as the alternative to category, you know, sort of this annihilation of difference toward a shiny gray, wholly undifferentiated blob of unity, an urge which can, uninterrogated, become a kind of fascist urge. And there's more to say about that. What I'm suggesting is that the alternative to category is specificity. Philosopher Rosie Bredotti, in her theorization of what she calls the plural subject, stresses that even within a context of interconnectedness, the plural subject she's theorizing is embodied and embedded, quote unquote, which is to say that we are specific, each unique. But even if this notion or this approach to the world is actually more ethical, kind, generous, or just plain old more true, to encounter the world in this way absolutely, as a rule, a doctrine, is difficult or maybe impossible. Roland Barthes says that even if a thing seems to be the same as another thing, treat it as if it were different. But where does this exhortation begin and end? And how do we take it on, wear it on a daily human scale? But here's the question phrased differently. This urge to examine, to see, to grab, to touch the world with my mind, to be in, encounter, to know more, what are some ways it can work Right off the bat here, we must acknowledge that different modes will work best for different people at different times with different goals. And second, we should also acknowledge that sometimes the urge to know and the subsequent knowing will take place largely, largely in language. That is where most of us have been taught to consciously register our knowing or mastery as the case may be. But along with that, we must also recognize that there are many kinds of knowing and that those alternative forms have been largely, depending on who you're talking to, undervalued, take the binary rational and irrational, for example. Certain of these alternate knowings, precisely because they are deep, 
are not coalescing into language. They are non-language knowings and so can be difficult to communicate about. And so this might be a reason why they're undervalued too. We, some of us, prize conversation as encounter, speech as the mediating object, this ropey bridge between us, making sentences and then offering them as connective tissue is a huge part of encounter, and I get that. By language, I'm off, uh, afforded sociality, at which point it often scarcely matters what I'm saying, only that we're talking, that we desire someone's company. One of the things discourse can do ecstatically is augment, knit, even secrete homens, human sexuality. I'll say that sentence again. One of the things discourse can do ecstatically is augment, knit, even secrete human sociality. I realize that now I'm equating language with category. And while there's some truth to that, that concepts do not fully go into their descriptions. And so in the effort to make sentences from thoughts, something is lost, or at least something is left in the air nearby. While there's some truth to that, I am comforted simultaneously by the fact that language does more than fail to represent. Language also always becomes things that are also themselves manifest things, which is to say, almost like something from nothing, language can push into existence presences, thought objects that were not there before. And by this, I'm often enabled to uh, the ability to see or feel what heretofore I could not. In this case, language is a kind of touching, like little grabby raccoon hands, palpating and cleaning food in the creek at night, feely little hands finding shapes there, making discoveries. But also, maybe like magic, maybe the more you touch, the more you find. And so, borrowing from Edward Lestant here, I think poetics, language-based or otherwise, and I lately use the word poetics as a synonym for art, maybe poetics, feverishly practice, is a way we can attempt the impossible work of addressing that which is unknowable, or maybe unsayable, or maybe unmasterable. And by the word poetics, I'm not indicating vagueness, in fact, just the opposite. I'm talking about the proliferative filigree of specificity, difference par excellence, the fuel for what Glissant calls relation or totality. Poetics practiced in this way doesn't take up ideas that are otherwise clear and then obscure them, but rather produces or introduces something irreducibly singular, something important. Glissant has written, we demand the right to opacity. But to finish my point, and remember this started with the binders, what thoughts can I have about category? It's motley functionality, it's violences, it's dispensations. Can I finally make a few thoughts about it and then put it down and move on? Am I busying myself with a misprecision on this account? Because I can no more control my use of analogical or categorical thinking or willy-nilly semblance making than I can the rain. But sometimes I wish I could. And these decisions about how to proceed are for me also an admittedly political concern and a daily living concern. In 2007, I had a job interview, my first real shot at a permanent faculty position, which would have placed me in the sculpture department at UCLA. During the interview, by way of introduction, there were things I was trying to tell the committee, you know, my new research-based practice included a lot of reading, theory, science, history, etc. And in trying to contextualize how new and pleasurable all of that felt, all of that textual pursuit, discovery, and analysis, I announced that for the period of time between when I quit undergrad and when I went to grad school, a period of about 15 years, I had conducted a sustained life experiment in which I had, quote unquote, tried not to think for 15 years. At the job interview, as soon as I said it, I remember being certain that this news would disqualify me. It didn't, but I had thought it would. My memory of that interview fails after this sort of main event, this wash of fear, but let me loop back around. The impulse to not think, which resulted in this years long experiment, and maybe this is a given, but I think it bears saying here, it had everything to do with the particulars of my biography, including, but not by any stretch limited to the location of our far north Chicago suburb, which was in fact the rural suburban threshold marked by Rust Belt style faltering small industry and pollution. The fact that I had grown up in what we all called subdivisions, where all the houses looked alike, the streets were new and curved just so. The way those subdivisions had been excised from and were still wholly surrounded by 
farm fields, meadows, abandoned nurseries, unfinished abandoned freeways. Also the budding agitprop of the early ecology movement in the 70s, which in every case hit me like a ton of bricks. And because we traveled so seldom and for a million other reasons, I believe that every bit of the surface of the earth had already been ruined beyond repair. People polluting, being shitheads, carving up and administering arbitrary order onto things that are vast and actually uncontainable. It seemed that this celebrated thinking part was overrated, I thought. Whatever it is that nature does, that's what I want to do. And so, landing in San Francisco in 1985, the experiment was, yes, to not think as defined by book learning, say. I operated on an unfortunate misperception linking intellectualism to elitism. Thus, I avoided institutions in particular, their propaganda, the canons there, this inculcation to instrumentalization. I resolved to find information from people unmarred by academia. And other than that, I would ideally glean everything from my own flesh somehow, a phrase I oft repeated. For example, as we traveled around the West Coast, hitchhiking or otherwise, we would issue guidebooks and roadmaps. We actually drove around without maps toward Oregon, say, and if we saw something that looked like public lands, green trees, a raging river, we would park and walk in and camp. Where were we? I could not tell you. What was around the bend? I did not know and could only imagine. When I was 23, I took a course in furniture and cabinet making. The teacher introduced us one by one to a room of hand tools. He had these beautiful calipers, slender little long-fingered tendrils. He told us that we should, when possible, use calipers because measurement was inaccurate. It was always an approximation and that the inaccuracy would only grow as we translated it, ruler to ruler, mark with a pencil, etc. The thing that sticks in my head even now is that he would press these little skinny arms around the stub end of a piece of wood. He would tighten it and then he'd say, how big is it? It's this big and hold up the calipers. You would see the space there and it would be full of information that had no words at all. It seemed to me that that information was somehow unpinned by index or translation, a top left spinning. Could we have gone farther and seen more if we'd had a map or any information on the land? Yes, undoubtedly something was seated in the deal. But I've come to think of it in terms of what was manifest during those years. Briefly, among other things, it was a practice in orders of knowledge and somatic learning, this commitment to directness, thrumming nowness, a practice of initiating yes, which is to say I developed a habit of being sensitized to the possibilities of the moment at hand. I was learning. I ran a space, organized shows. That time was full with art, activism, so much love, in a community marked by sharp wit and fierce intelligence and honestly more laughter more constantly than I have ever experienced since. In my view, the ideas, as artists anyway, the ideas and questions we entertain, our undertakings, always have a connection to a body, a particular consciousness, some ultra-specific biography. A philosopher, author, thinker, or artist may not mention or try to pin down the unquantifiable reasons a particular question has arrived in their field of vision, but this choice in no way changes the fact. All theory starts somewhere on the ground in a life. Everyone builds from the ground. And the thing is, I like to assign causes, create little nets of cause and effect, and it's a comfort, no doubt. And I'm not going to say there's no cause and effect, but I have to remind myself that because the world is an untrackable open system, I'm not actually able to know what has caused what. My assignations, which by definition are approximate, must therefore be something to hold lightly, lest they function to oversimplify a reading, especially when I think I know something about someone, about their biography, and then start making assumptions. One more thing on that. As maker, particularly with projects that are considered to be nonfiction, there's a possibility of including things like Brechtian interventions into an aura of facticity. I like to do that. Add reminders that, well, this thing you're holding, it's not a representation. It's a new thing. So, about the book. I've always believed in the magic of allowing my largest points or messages or even storylines to be generated in the energy and affect of the unsaid. Which is to say, the territory between and around what is said or shown is actually the star of the show. 
I'm inscribing, but I'm not drawing a thing, a figure. I'm working in the field, etching resonant things around it. Uh, uh, the, the gambit is that a shape or a fullness emerges in the space of what I have not touched directly. As far as my meteorite specifically, there were inchoate surgings at first, these pools of amino acids waiting for a charge, some strategic bolt of lightning. And for this talk, I've traced that a bit. In 2003, I was struggling with this long document thing, a series of numbered fragments, this list of hunches, personal anecdotes, a litany of research items I thought were connected somehow. I actually described part of that contest in my meteorite, that scene in the hotel room, wrestling this beast, trying to chop bits of it out for a short performance and failing. At that time, the document was like a weapon for communication that was just too heavy to even pick up like a giant muscular live octopus trying to escape. And I was hugging and building and grappling, but it was way too slippery and also a little bit angry. Eventually I had to put this document in a box under the bed, as Maggie says, I had to forget about it. But I continued my research, compiled things. One of the primary catalysts for my reading during this period, 2005-ish, was my theory that everything in the world was actually made out of the same one elementary particle postulation that, had it been true, would have meant that every perceived difference, shape, or edge was simply the result of variations in arrangement and or density, kind of material syntax. So no edges really technically existed. Thus, everything, the world, the universe, was one thing. And though I searched for a long time, hunched over books, hunched over my laptop, I found almost no evidence to support this notion. I kept running into difference and diversity, which at that moment means I was finding a lot of information about ecosystem, open systems. I was in the middle of trying to make some sense of the idea of difference, take it on board. How would it interact with this impression I had of being connected to everything else, that everything was permeated with everything else? I had just come up with the idea of thresholds that have dimension, dimensional thresholds contaminated by elseness, which preserve the idea of difference without adding back in the idea of hard edges. I had this image of a coagulated, I had this image of coagulated specificities floating in a field of everything else-ness. When I met Maggie, finally, someone who would hear me out on stuff, no sideways looks. She was neither annoyed nor afraid. In fact, she met my thought fever with her own thought fever. Even in the initial stages of our romance, I used to leave her house because I wanted to go home and gather my thoughts more articulately, parse things I wanted to write to her <laughs> rather than talk to her. I learned that writing is a place that enables me to find thoughts. And a big part of that was starting to believe, one, there was time enough. And two, whatever I didn't tell you now, if it still mattered, I could always tell you later. But I sure as heck can't tell you everything at once. In, tw in 2013, I made this pamphlet, as I mentioned, called River of the Mother of God, V2. I'd been making sculpture and video for a while, exhibiting my work, but something was off for me. I knew the artwork provided something singular, an experience. And I believed that that thing was social, among other things, that any artwork is certainly a missive from an artist. And by that, some connective tissue, a kind of sociality would be catalyzed and human connection would automatically follow. But something was off. I was plagued by a kind of loneliness. I started, to wonder whether, uh, I started to wonder whether I was correct that any experience of my work might be easily translated to language and thus sociality. And more precisely, I started to wonder whether it was possible or even desirable for a viewer to glean my questions, the operative questions from the work. Because after all, these things are separate. I can outright tell you the questions, but grappling with them, undertaking activities suggested by them is quite a different thing. So as a kind of experiment in art and sociality, I decided to write out some of my interests, questions, thoughts, and to present that writing in the form of a takeaway pamphlet alongside my video and sculpture during the Made in LA show at the Hammer Museum in 2014. Around that time, while Maggie wrote The Argonauts, we passed it back and forth, trying to make language and context for a representation of me in the book. Now and again, I urged her to add tons more examples of indeterminacy, believing the portrayal of me, specifically my completely non-representable relationship to what the culture calls gender, 
would thereby, and should rightly, I thought, be readable as a tiny fleeting example in a flood of examples of this thing indeterminacy, examples of the wavelength never collapsing. The thing indeterminacy, constant flux, would ideally, as far as I was concerned, describe everyone and everything. By way of response to this appeal, Maggie kept saying, that's your book. An assertion which I obviously took on board as an invitation or maybe just a game plan. As I've said, uh, one of the primary characteristics of my practice is literally sitting or walking and thinking hard. I really do experience thinking as a full body pleasure. And that means collecting things that confuse me and then burrowing in, trying to disambiguate, check my hunches as proposals or absurd, uh, absurd extrapolations. I also teach, which is a pressure and a pleasure. And I teach in much the same way I communicate in artwork, trying to set up points of study, allow for people to build thoughts in the fertile interstices. I mention it here because that calling further reinforces this modality, gathering texts, annotating passages, and tracking the weird phases of a thought in process. I don't read anything without a pencil. This is all to say that in every moment, I'm always already churning with these lovely desperate turbulences, trying to will myself into the place behind the cotton wool. So when it comes time to begin, to begin making a show or a book, it's fair to say the raw materials are there. In some sense, there is enough to begin. In 2015, the year before I started the book project and trying to keep my thinking fresh, I was in a full overhaul of my sort of primitivist, survivalist, neo-Luddite technophobia. I'd been reading Rosie Bredati and some Hito Styro, both of whom I was really enjoying. And it seemed that according to these two, not everything about everything high tech was sorrowful and tragic. And they also seemed to be allowing for some future, which was to include continuing advances in technology. My plan to go backward technologically, it started to strike me as calcified. I made an exhibition for wall space called the cybernetic fold, where I was trying to chew on some of these new questions I had about tech. I was pondering pixels, remoteness, the flatness of the screen. Was there a body behind the flatness? Did flatness itself have a body or any dimension? Was a lack of resolution to be understood as absolutely impoverished? And then what about higher and higher resolution experiences objects? Did communication characterized by remoteness have to be synonymous with a kind of sensual aridity or insufficiency? And then one day welding for the first time, I suddenly realized that though I'd often associated metals with robots, computers, machinery, the unnatural, unfeeling coldness of industrial capitalism, metals actually come out of the earth. And far from being fundamentally unnatural, metals were comprised of and descended from the same particles as me and everything else. This is the weird web of things that were in play when researching minerals one day i.e. shopping for crystals on eBay. I took a weird turn and stumbled into the iron meteorite aisle. When I saw my meteorite, I promptly fell in love. Soon after it arrived to me by post, one fair morning, my new friend, the meteorite, told me to write a book. It is no exaggeration to say that this exhortation I heeded at once, walked to my computer and began writing. Now, I've done a good amount of writing evening like performative monologues, feature screenplays, short stories, a few essays, but initially, because I had never properly written a book, there was some psychological stuff to get through. I told myself and a few other people that I was pretending to write a book, which introduced a kind of pantomime element into the process of pretending that helped. I also decided that though I would use materials gleaned from my own experiences, I'd consider the book to be fiction. This was a little schism that made space too. It felt like I broke a rock and then set the two pieces back together. I also immediately decided to simply take notes, as I called it, track things in a messy, absolutely abbreviated form to be truly written or filled out at a later time. In this way, I could avoid being waylaid by a kind of characteristic oceanic quality that overtakes my hands when I type. I've learned to make holding structures very early in any making process. For example, I'll say, all right, there's going to be two videos and so-and-so length, three sculptures, four drawings. The structure allows me to begin, though while in process, I remain open to the likelihood that these things will change. And back to this notion of the peripheral, which is crucial, especially in the early phases of a project and unquestionably so in the 
initiation of this book. Certain very faint stars can only be seen in one's peripheral vision. To see them, we must look away. While I practice, I cultivate and am thus saturated by an odd vigilance, kind of open-heartedness, like antennae that convey what is popping and growing in this proximate fecund swarm that exists sort of behind me. It's next to me, sending messages while I busy myself with other things. This is a kind of gambit, like trying to tame a coyote or at least have it over to dinner. Instinctively, you know, you must busy yourself with the casserole, right? Or at least be facing away from the door, fo focusing on the stove, cutting things, tasting what is there. You don't want to scare it away. So you're just listening. Maybe you close your eyes and now you hear whispery footsteps, the creatures breathing. Eventually close enough, you sense an alacrity and quietly this detente becomes an alliance, however short lived. This dance characterizes well the year long period of note taking. Thus I was attentive to the book as a whole, allowing this practice of obliqueness to generate items that I would devotedly note in the document which as a rule, I did not reread. And we know that inspiration is 99% perspiration. So I continued to jot down brief descriptions of daily events, always at the end of the document. I would sometimes allow myself to add things in a particular order, but I would always go in half-witted, making sure not to hard focus or begin writing in earnest, as I called it. This was a gathering period, but also a period of just listening to the world and listening to myself in the world, feeling linkages, rhymes related to the book project as I continue to research in the way I just always do. Coinciding with the arrival of the meteorite, I had initiated this odd, misbegotten, mystical social experiment too, a scheme to get myself out of the studio and into encounters with other human creatures. It seemed that as soon as I started making more human connection, so too it happened that more coincidences occurred. So I did also have concrete things to track, some magnet that organized what I was noticing, or at least for the thread, on sculpture and sociality. I had for some time been aware of this set, this trio, fairly riveting coincidences from my life. I remember sensing that I could build off these straightforward stories as a core, especially because tales related to an adoption reunion and particularly mine would likely be gripping. There were other memories I had, narratives that wouldn't leave me alone, anecdotes I had related again and again, and I started to track those too. For example, this trip to the museum as an 11 year old where I saw this red plexiglass box sculpture that had ignited my desire to be an artist. Early on, I made a decision to use instances of current technological innovation as historical markers. As I say in the book, technology is nature cultures in time. For example, new modes of surveillance, breakthroughs in machine intelligence, virtual reality advances, a facility opened in 2016 called LIGO, L-I-G-O, that could detect gravitational waves made by the collision and amalgamation of two black holes 20 million centuries ago. Most every invention or thought is built on hundreds of others that have come before. Certain thinkers have even suggested that technology is inevitable, noting the frequency of near simultaneous breakthroughs by otherwise unrelated people. Existing knowledge sets the table for next steps. Existing knowledge sets the table for next steps. It accrues. Along these lines, folks who theorize about whether there is intelligent life on other planets assume that given a starting point for organic life and given the habits of matter, most civilizations in universes where materials and physics are the same as ours will proceed at a similar clip, including technologically. I decided to provide forward progression, which people enjoy, by chronologizing the year 2016. And in this, I collected possible subplots that would be told linearly in such a way that they would provide some urge to resolution, otherwise known as tension. In creating time-based projects, I grapple with conventions of durational viewing, novels, movies, these ways we've been habituated to long works. The conventions, I'm aware of picking them up and aware of putting them aside. Note-taking lasted a year. The day after my dad died, there was a sharp change in my approach to the manuscript. I sat down and began writing in earnest. And this is where I shifted my practice from being in the studio full time, by which I mean maybe 25 or 30 hours a week, to writing with just the same application of time and commitment. Now, I really focused on being in the document in a more voluptuous frame of mind. I willed myself to address each of the notes thoroughly, use them as fodder for whatever might come, 
one notable exception to that was that I decided to leave notes on social events pretty bare bones and by contrast to really let fly with description when it came to wilderness settings. A formal experiment that I thought might convey characteristic misanthropy or alienation. I also decided to add keys or legends, a series of softly instructive, even Brechtian asides or guides that would point back at the book itself. The shift from notes to writing was pretty distinct for me. There's some other doors in my body that I opened, a deep ratification. The hallway initially is a very wide one and littered with things. I can run down it, carrying stuff, picking up more stuff. It's true that at the start of a session, I might quickly jot some things, you know, stuff that's sitting on the edge of the table or that can just knock onto the page like dust or loose crumbs. But basically, once there's a scent, some frame, I'm going in hard, affirmatively, making sentences, and it is, for me, an intense, very conscious process. It's important to say here that what appears on the page initially, these ideas are almost entirely bunched up in knots. Thoughts that contain five thoughts that will need to be pulled apart, a jumble of stuff, and that is fine. As a younger writer, I was slow from the start and would hence lose my way, too myopic, wrong pace for a bigger picture. I allow here, uh, uh, I allow for digression. That sense of obliqueness as fertility is still in play. I try to let the swarm behind my ear shoot stuff into my fingers too. And there's a pause in the flow. That's when I read over and start to build something more precise. And this is slow. Am I saying what I want to say? I consider grammar, word choice, prosody, accuracy. Are the nouns pointing to what they need to be pointing to? Are they pointing wrong? And what is the real verb or the actual preposition that should be here? What is the actual dynamic that I'm describing that I want to be describing? It's writing, but not to finish. It's writing to test. Editing video is for me a similar process. Thoughts must be teased into existence. The structure and progression of the section is attended to, woven into a form that sings about what it might be when it's completed. This is a mid-zone phase, and it's utterly time-consuming. It doesn't matter that I may, in the final draft, scrap it entirely. This is where I do trial amplitude runs. It's like testing snow or plaster or egg whites for personality, stickiness, density, potential for amplitude so that when I come back later, I will know what's possible there almost as soon as I encounter it. At that point, with an eye to the whole, I will move on and do it all again until I've touched and tested everything. After that, I begin reading through the document and start to foster it as a whole, going back into all sections, rewriting with an eye to a finish, pressuring the text with new additional concerns. And with this finer grit sanding, Mores appear like a grain in wood or opalescence in a shell that wasn't visible before this step. And so that also means responding to that, building off that too, adding. I need to create an ordered superstructure. So I'm moving sections around, throwing stuff away with an eye and an ear to sedimentary processes, a reader's experience. Early on in the process of writing my meteorite, I decided to use a fugue structure. This is a term for music a compositional technique in which a melody or phrase is introduced by certain instruments in successively different keys, and in which over the course of the whole piece, instruments and related additional phrases are added and interwoven, at which point certain instruments and phrases will fall away, replaced by still other instruments and phrases, and which ends by a kind of looping back. My meteorite is comprised by evolving threads incantations, which eventually merge or rhyme or link up, however briefly. I'm aware that each of the threads is a figure, a relatively macro figure, and that each of the threads is comprised by figures too. I repeat, as in motifs, for example, a particular voice or register is deployed again and again. Often the figure is a repeated word, phrase, or prosody. Some of the figures are actual things, the iron meteorite, the birth mother, flesh, which in this book is usually discussed in one of two ways, sex or instances of light gore like bleeding wounds or autopsies, which I often place next to each other on purpose. Or say the character of the author watching films at night or the mention of social isolation. The figures are themselves, but also metaphors and also something else, something loaded down with suitcases for different occasions. They bring specific and evolving affects, attached concepts, etc. Use of this structuring principle, the fugue, meant that a few of the topical threads would themselves transform over the course of the book. And so I also began at this time to group 
order and then place these eight periodically repeating through lines. This seems an apt time to point out that the word random in the title does not refer to the sequency of the sections in the manuscript. The notion of random in the book is very much deployed as a kind of fulcrum or maybe a volcano from which questions flow about patternicity and determinism correlated to the habits of matter, a paradigm which contrasts philosophically with the implications of a random, non-deterministic cosmos where free will implies pure chance and in some way meaninglessness or maybe even a fundamental disconnectedness. In the book, for the character of the author, this is a sort of indissoluble conundrum. During the final phase, I'm trying to hold everything at once. How are the theoretical, emo how are the theoretical emotional concepts and figures evolving over the course of the manuscript? What's happening emotionally over the course of the text, meaning how will the text grip and move a reader? Among other things, I'm aware that a book navigates the beginning of a relationship, a certain kind of friendship builds or intimacy. So even as a result to being honest in the offing, there is a pace to consider. Each thread is a figure comprised by other figures. And in entertaining the piece as a whole, I'm making them and weaving them, which is sculptural, but it has sound too. Every new sound will be heard in a wash of what has come before. In thinking about it now, poetic and musical terms come to mind. Subito, accelerando, retard, prosody, consonants, cesura. There is also an architecture of comprehension, the admission of concepts in a particular order, as in geometry proofs, corollaries accruing. And a part of that is, I'm also reckoning what is more apparently accessible in which a sense of mastery or connection is foregrounded with singular offerings that are indeed only available affectively or as non-language knowings. These lyric sections are key and can be thought of as corrective. A reminder that the prose and the book are more than a simple sum of parts. The word lyric here thus includes the lacuna or leaps, not always white space, those vibrating almost silences virtual imaginary, full with after image and muscle ache, full of non-language knowings. This field in which the turbulence of specificity is not pinned to language per se, to me, contains the real subject matter of the book. What takes place there is becoming, as it were, in the not empty spaces just next to what is manifest, that knowable thing, in the song of many songs at once, imminent in the field and everywhere else too, but perhaps more fugitive in the figure. That is what I'm most interested in. And what's also included in that, for me, is the reader. The fullness of their encounter with that field, the very diffuse meat that is relation is love, evidences a will to encounter in general. And it strikes me as daring, the willingness to meet up in non-language knowings, which is, after all, how we are bound to meet up. That inclination, or appetite, is very moving to me. So that's the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for listening and I um, guess we have time for questions now. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Harry. That was really beautiful. Um, we're already getting a couple of questions coming in. So if anyone does have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, so to open, we have a question from Carolina Hicks who writes, hi, Harry, very life affirming thoughts and insights shared today. Thank you for all this existing that you bring forward. Your methodologies inspire more courage in me. What does your psychic and emotional hygiene look like for you lately? Re the concept of habits and practice. What are some specific current daily habits you're practicing as of late? Um, well, thank you for the question. Hi, Carolina. Um, that, uh, that's a stumper. Um, I assume that hygiene sort of refers back to like how I'm caring for myself and how I'm making sure, you know, uh, 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 you know, that, 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 uh, there, there's certain things coming in as other things are going out. And, you know, it, honestly, it's not something I think about very much, although I know that it, it's a conversation that's being talked about, uh, something that people are talking about more. Um, I, I better get on the stick. That much is clear.
Okay, so um, as we wait for more questions, I know both Jack and I have a couple. So mine are meandering, so bear with me here. Um, I guess maybe we'll, I'll begin with just taking up the fact that science and magic are obviously core, you know, sort of unavoidables in your book. And they're two terms so often wrapped up in questions of legitimacy, intelligibility, ontology, seemingly at odds in a kind of irreconcilable conflict, not unlike science and religion. And quantum physics represents one of those places where science comes to touch the speculative. Hence, we have, you know, books like yours, other thinkers like Karen Barad engaging, you know, physics alongside a more philosophical, speculative way of writing. And I think of your mention in this talk, when you when you reference like referencing Lorenz on planting a seed for a new science. And also your note that at one point in writing the book, you were you sought to not think in the sense of book learning. So I think this idea of thinking, criticality, rigor, science, all terms that are seemingly at odds in, in some people's minds with magic. So I guess I'm, I'm what I'm asking is, did you have some kind of, we mentioned this idea of fulcrum or kind of core that you would come back to when you're thinking about these terms? Was it important to you to have some sort of coherent philosophy or schema that you were engendering in the book or were you more just interested in having these different concepts kind of constellate as part of your process of writing through consciousness? This is a great question. Um, I think what I, I think, um, what I'm trying to do in the book is acknowledge that articulation has its limits and that even though it's lovely and it's amazing and it's, uh, it gets us really far, it's just an amazing thing, right? Language is and uh, thinking is, it's, uh, it's uh, 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 maybe limitless, but it, uh, you know, but, but this idea that there, there's some uh, a way that it can't approach this idea of you know, the unknowable, this, this, this infinity or the universe itself, right? So I acknowledge that there's a gap. Right, I, but it, I try not to go into a binary place with it. Right, I acknowledge this gray area, this kind of ecstatic gray area of the filigree uh, uh, that's available in thinking and in articulation and in pressing forward, um, and, and to the point where even you know in this Lorenz example, they've they've got to this uh, uh, new kind of looking and new kind of measuring that had, oh, that kind of cracked open. Uh, from this idea of repeatability, the cycle that repeats as the only thing that counts, right? To a kind of uh, slightly different thing, which allowed them to notice other kinds of truths or facts or motion um, and, um, uh, um, or patterns, uh, patterns that don't repeat. And so uh, I think in trying to crack that open, um, I wanted to introduce the idea of, uh, continually press, continually trying to go there, right? If we are gonna think, and if we are gonna go for articulation, and if we are gonna live, um, uh, um, how is it that we will uh, uh, negotiate categorical thinking, which can also be great, um, uh, how will we negotiate those, those kind of loose approximation, that, that thing that allows us to whip through a day, how do we negotiate that with this other kind of specificity that seems like it's indicated as a practice, you know, in order to keep us kind of in a wash of, of the new uh, and uh, in, in a wash of, of, of a kind of close, uh, getting close, living more closely with things that are um, fantastic. <laughs> uh, and so I don't want to, um, uh, uh, I don't want to, uh, pull those things apart into a binary. In in some ways, just just the opposite. And I I think um, trying to knock into some of the, uh, of that gray area and some of that like um, give and take of articulation, like it can get you this far but not this far. So maybe at that point, art or kind of poetics or this other kind of process where we're like trying to kind of take a net and catch. The, these specificities without pinning them down and grapple with them. And it's so hard and uncomfortable when we try to do that. Maybe there's something also there, right? But it's really hard to know because they're so difficult to even, the, 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 that type of knowing is, is very difficult to register. It doesn't feel like mastery. 
and um, we don't know if we're doing it right. And so, uh, uh, you know, but I, I guess the book is an exhortation uh, to that um, and the sort of practice of that too. Yeah, I mean, that certainly comes through in your writing and the way that you structured the book. And, you know, I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, because I've thought a lot about this kind of idea of, of auto theory as an emerging genre, but um, Sophia Samatar and Banu Kapil have this quote tweeting that they came across this term called life thinking around the same time that auto theory was being circulated and life thinking as if that is in contrast to life writing. <laughs> and I've kind of thought about that because, you know, in your talk, in your book, it's like, okay, writing is slash as thinking, you know, is the other life writing not thinking? And so it's something that I've kind of been thinking about because certain, you know, I, I understand on, on the one hand, a lot of uh, auto theoretical work, you know, your, your book included will engage directly with systems of thought like philosophy, for example, and thus it, it might be seen as more of a, a legitimate kind of way of thinking. And yet I think what you do so beautifully and what you've um, you know, illuminated in this talk this evening is you know, reinscribing and, and kind of reclaiming the fact that a practice of writing is a practice of thinking. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is for me. Um, there's a, a real, like, I, like where I described the little raccoon hands, you know, <laughs> um, I was making that sentence, you know, and, and I often, when I think about me writing and I think about me finding thoughts while writing, I really, really, really am finding things that were maybe jumbled up. So maybe they were like nuggets in a kind of weird mass. So maybe they were there, but it really feels like when I try and say it too fast, I get a jumble, I get a blob. Um, and that pulling, 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 little raccoon hand pulling, um, you know, it does feel like I'm thinking you know, and um, it does, and, and it was funny when I was writing that, which is what I started to say, when I was writing that, um, I thought, but that characterizes writing as simply a kind of interpretation of the things that are always in your, that are already in your head. Like as if there's a jumble in my head, and if I write enough, I'll unjumble it, right? So I wrote that sentence out about the raccoon hands. And then I remember thinking, that's not everything I believe about that moment. And so that's why I added, but maybe it's like magic. Maybe the more you look, the more you find. And that feels um, like the part that is thinking, you know, and um, that uh, uh, it feels very particular to me, the idea that, there, that I'm generating things by being there in the first place. And in the book, I talk about this a little bit too, when I start to talk about um, dementia and the, the, the body thinking and uh, some of these thoughts people are having about, um, you know, like the way knowledge lives in your body. Um, I'm very interested in that because I often, as an artist, feel like my body is a lot smarter than my language brain. This is something I say. <laughs> my body's way ahead of my language brain. It's having all kinds of amazing thoughts and knowledges, you know, and it's only a few of them that will, that will come into sentence form. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I think they think of it as the other way around. Um, and uh, so um, the, this idea is that, um, uh, um, as far as prosthesis <laughs> and, and as far as like artificial intelligence or, or our relationship, you know, cyborgian, as far as like the condition of being a cyborg, I guess is what I wanted to say, is, is this a new thought about that, which is like just the fact that when we write stuff down, even with a pencil, like oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this, we're already in a kind of prosthesis mode of using things that are outside of the membrane of the skin in order to aid us and aid our thoughts and sort of hold stuff that would normally maybe should or could be held uh, um, only in the mind and and sort of on from there. So I think it's it's a, a, absolutely fascinating to think of writing as um, uh, also as thinking, even though it's happening in some sense um, outside of the body. Yes. Oh, so we have quite a few questions coming in now. Um, maybe one uh, good follow up would be from Ella Rosenblatt here who asks, how can we propose alternative epistemologies or imaginings of the world and science without spreading misinformation or non-facts? I know. It's a big one. 
<laughs> really on my mind for sure. Um, and I, it's something that I'm still thinking about. You know, I don't have a, I don't have a fast answer to that, obviously, because when I, and it's right there with me. It's like in me all the time as, I, as I'm talking about body knowledges and these things that are not provable yet, you know, and, and trying to honor that or revalue these kinds of knowings. Um, I, it, it's, all, it's very much attended, especially in this climate where all kinds of knowings are leading down all kinds of, 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 of regrettable uh, uh, places. Uh, uh, and so I don't have an answer but it is something that's on my mind, you know, and, and it, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about in the paper and in the book, you know, where I'll make a thought. I'll be like, here's a proposal, non-language knowings, and then I, and uh, revaluation, you know, and then I think, but if you extrapolate and you push on that, you know, there's, there's like these messed up places that it sort of bangs into. I love that. <laughs> and so, it could be that that's the kind of thing that as an artist or a thinker, I keep banging into that. And I think I got to make some more thoughts about that. You know, I have to either take up a, a leg of research um, uh, and start to sort of wind in that direction um, and things that I'm looking at researching, stuff like that. So um, I, I like it as a question and I, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that, um, you know, a lot of us are aware of as, as we work now, especially like the stakes of parafiction and other related practices feel, you know, extra high in, in this climate. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was what was interesting is I did write the whole book thinking I was going to put fiction on the back cover, mm -hmm. whatever genre, you know, when I thought about genre, I was like, because I, I kind of like the idea, you know, when I said about like I broke a rock and then put it back next to each other. I like the idea of that intervention of something that seems apparently true. And then you sort of send it out into the world and say, mm -mm, or, mm -mm, you know, just this kind of hedging, but also a kind of reminder that of course it's fiction. I just put all, I just put all of this stuff into words. It's not true. You know, I just made something. And so, um, uh, it was only at the last second, you know, in sort of, talking with a few people about it. I, I did not find one person who supported me <laughs> uh, to put fiction. Um, and uh, I remember I told one person I had a conversation with, I was like, well, you know, I didn't look anything up. You know, I just did this from memory. Um, so like when I talk about the guy who cut down, you know, the oldest living tree, the old world's oldest living thing, and that it had 4,297 rings or whatever, I didn't look that up. It was just a number that I remembered, I, a number I imagined to be the right number. And, and uh, there was a lot of stuff I didn't look up because I wanted to, uh, uh, because there was also a performance of misremembering that I was interested in thematically um, because uh, of the misremembering, all the mis, all, let's just say without giving anything away, all the misremembering that becomes generative and fruitful and all of those kind of dog legs um, that uh, uh, caused characters in my book to reconsider what the real is comprised of, you know, and, um, and uh, yeah. We have a couple of questions here bringing us back to the body. Um, so one uh, um, anonymous question here, you talk about full body thinking. Does the experience also flow in the other direction? How do you experience bodily sensations that constellate thoughts without conscious thinking? So it seems like you're already alluding to this actually. Um, and then how is peripheral thinking connected to sensuous experience? Mm. Those are great questions. I love those questions. There's another question too that maybe I can add into the conversation because it's. Okay, but you're going to have to repeat all of them. What's the last one? <laughs> repeat them all again. Yep. Okay. Um, from Jones Michaela here. Uh, Michaela writes Hi, Harry. Do you have any suggestions of how to foster thinking as a full body pleasure? Mm -hmm. Is there a way in which you provoke your moments of sitting or walking thought? Oh, sorry. Of sitting, walking thought or expand it. Sorry, Michaela, I'm not sure what you mean here. Um, and then also, I love your tattoos. Many thanks for this deeply thought provoking talk. <laughs> so yeah, so thinking as full body pleasure, we have um, this relationship between thinking 
and sensuous experience and a kind of interflow between. I guess, do you see it as a kind of exchange between? Do you see it as some kind of directional movement? Um, well, it seems like right, there's a little piece in there that seemed like uh, uh, like my my version of, uh, you know, the, I sort of changed it when it popped into my head, but it was kind of like, could something be a peripheral thought and still be felt at all? Could it be a sensual, you know, could, could I sense it? <laughs> Could it be a feeling in my body and still be a peripheral thought, basically, which is, which is kind of a semantics question or a definition de definition of peripheral question, you know. Um, but I think, you know, let's, you know, just uh, some of this, like even if you are reading something um, or basically maybe, especially if we're talking about non language, looking at a work of art that doesn't have language in it. And, um, you know, we look at art, we look at art, we look at art. Every once in a while, we look at art, we look at something. And there's like a for me anyway every once in a while there's just like a weird feeling that i'm overtaken with you know and it's a confusing feeling and maybe i want to cry or maybe i want to laugh and and i i can no longer keep going through the museum or whatever it is like it just fills me up and to me that's like an example of a a, a very sensual um non-language knowing you know um, and it's a full experience that that has all of the filigree of fullness um, without being uh, translated into language. So I, I don't think that they're separate. I don't think that a, a, a non-language knowing uh, uh, has to be non-sensual. Not at all. Um, in fact, yeah, not at all, now that I think of it. But um, yeah, was, there was another part to that. Um, I guess then the question of pleasure, thinking as full body pleasure, is there ways that you perhaps engage that? Is there ways in which you provoke your moments of sitting or walking? Well, you know, uh, I actually, think, it's like a practice, I guess. Yeah, it's a practice. I, you know, I did tell the story, you know, of that one first kind of moment of it that is very clear memory for me, you know, that this kind of like, a, I had a strong thought and then I had another strong thought and they both seem really true and now they got to like dance around and there was something about that music of them uh, this kind of like atonal <laughs> humming um that was outside of any other experience i had had up to that point or whatever you know it was special you know and um so i think there's something there about touching it and returning to it and being aware of how to be there so it's not just thinking necessarily it's being confused <laughs> And and uh, testing my thoughts that's that's a pleasure and um, how to get there I guess is just uh, it seems like, like the first um, uh, uh, step in that is to um, not be uh, scared or uh, to and not not to avoid the discomfort of entertaining two things at the same time that don't agree um, and. Uh, you know, especially right now, there's just like a lot of polarization, like there's a lot of like, if you're not with me or against me, you know, and, and that is exactly not what I'm talking about, right? There's a kind of like, what, what is this practice of letting the other thing in and it's living and I, these are both strong thoughts, and yet um, I'm not going to allow them to polarize, you know, so there has to be a way that they, uh, like, what is the way I can get them to enmesh or live in one space, or I need to change one of those thoughts. Too. Um, one of them has to go, but but to get there, um, you're sort of in the holding the both at once. Or this doesn't have to be two. It can be it can be obviously a cloud of thoughts, three, four, whatever, several. Um, so I think that's the first thing. And 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 I think learning to enjoy being confused is uh, is the is the trick because I think the uh, culturally, at least my you know the way I grew up, you were not, you were supposed to be embarrassed if you were confused, you know. There's a kind of badness about it, um, but I think my valuation of it, not just the memory I have, but you know, there's a kind of uh, conscious valuation of it, which has to be like this idea of thought in process, you know. Um, and if you wanted an artistic valuation, you could just be trying to say, well, I'm trying to keep my thoughts are fresh and make sure that I'm not stuck, you know. Um, and my whole idea of like. We need to go back to no technology, no electricity. You know, I was feeling like that for a very long time. <laughs> I was happy. I was like, you know, 
this is great. I can't wait for electricity to disappear, you know? Um, and I, it was a while, it was a moment when I thought, you know what, that I think is getting old, you know, it's a stuck place. And, um, not only that, it's, it's just irrelevant. It's just not going to happen, you know? Uh, and so how can I, as an artist, I need to like be in a present thought about grappling with these things that are hard for me to grapple with, you know? And so I just launched into it and yes, there's a kind of joy there. Um, yeah. It's interesting too that the word shame came to mind, like this idea of almost actually just letting go of any shame associated with the state of confusion or not knowing, which seems to me tied also to the kind of politics of, of pleasure and, and you, you know, you mentioned affect and yes. Yeah. That, that is interesting. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Are you, are you good with that? Are you able to take one more? Um, so this is from Solange Leon, um, who, who notes, thoughts must be teased into existence. Yes, they resist, mind you. The, ind the indistinctness and opacity of the thoughts is what makes it infinitely attractive. And so here's the question. How do you wrestle with this fuzzing, luring avenues? You can fall down so many rabbit holes. How often do you stop yourself from walking down paths or why? These are all such great questions. They're also abstract um, too, but you know, they're also not abstract when you're in the middle of walking down a path, a thought path. Um, so uh, again, I don't have any answers to that, you know, but I think uh, the first thing that occurs to me in trying to address that question is that, um, I uh, try to, I think that's why I might read. And so I, I sort of canvas the culture, not, not always contemporary, sometimes contemporary. Like, what are you thinking about this right now? But also just trying to, to sort of let my uh, 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 sort of hunt and gather things that might be either directly related or obliquely related to this, this uh, uh, non-language knowing that I'm dealing with or these these kind of blind <laughs> pathways, you know. Um, and so there's always in some ways a concrete um, proposal, not always, but you know, this is the way I generate things to argue with uh, or things to sort of take on board or, um, and you know, my favorite thing is when I'm reading, 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 you know, and, and it seems like, oh, you're so cool, you're so cool, this is so cool, you know, and then suddenly they say something that is completely not what I think and I completely disagree with. And so sometimes because the trust has grown, uh, uh, I have to reconsider that thing. Whereas maybe in another book, I'd be like, whatever. But this person somehow has, has gained my trust in these other ways. And yet they're like in this weird, you know, giving me this weird thought, you know? Um, and so that's my favorite because then I think, oh, I'm gonna have to look at this again, you know? Um, but yeah, I think I just accompany myself um, and it's kind of like a social practice of, of trying to figure out what other people think too and, and uh, test those ideas with my own and yeah. Well, thank you again, Harry, for such an inspiring and living talk. It's really a pleasure to have you spend this time with us and, and share your thoughts on your writing process. So um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, thanks. thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, wow, it looks like I'm really somewhere else now. Um, thank you so much for that, Harry. I am left especially thinking about the Brechtian interventions into an era of facticity, which were which are, is such a clear articulation, clear, beautiful articulation of something that kept coming up in the book that was just like um, really productive mystery for me. So that's one, one big thing that I'm going to be left thinking about after that. So thank you. Um, and I think yeah, that wraps it for people who are interested in attending future symposium events. Um, Alex is going to post the link in the chat here. This is the very first event. Uh, the next one is expanding criticism through accessibility, a conversation between Sean Lee and Amanda Katia. And so to register for this event or for future ones, check out that link. Uh, and then we're also offering a 33% discount on subscriptions for attendees of tonight's program. So if the work that we do means something to you or if you enjoyed this program, um, check out that link as well. So that is all. Thank you so much, Harry Dodge. It's been dreamy. It's been a pleasure. Thank much, you. much left, left to ponder. I'm sure we could do this Q&A for another hour, but um, <laughs> short of that, thank you so much. All right. Good night.
Thank Take you. Care. See you soon.